Theatre Phonic presents Orchid Fields. Written by Barbara Jennings. Beryl O'Brien. This is amazing. I'd have known you anyway. You haven't changed a bit. How are you? I'm sorry. Do we know each other? I'm Rachel. Rachel Trent. Yes, I can see that from your name badge. We were in the same year at school. Don't you remember? I know it's been ten years, but... Oh, no. Of course you don't remember me. I'm not memorable. Rachel Trent, how awful of me to forget. But it's been a long time and you look so smart and grown up. Oh, whoops, that's even ruder than not recognising you in the first place. Uh, What's with the name badge? Do you work in the hotel? No, I'm at the conference. Uh, You're at the conference? I haven't seen you in the hall and no one else is wearing a name badge. No, I'm, I'm at the other conference. In the, what do you call it, the annex on the far side of the car park. Uh, I come over here in the breaks. Is your conference on the break as well? Almost. I sneaked out early. It was quite boring. I don't suppose you'd like to have a coffee, Beryl? Catch up a bit, if you have time. Yes, great. What about the small lounge opposite the lift? It's generally quiet there. Mmm, coffee. Just what I need. So, what are you doing with yourself these days, Rachel? Still in the old hometown? Oh, yes. I got a job with the council straight after school. I started in waste management, then moved to streets and parking, then to housing. Mm -hmm. I've been there ever since. I like it. I feel useful. I got my present job a year ago. This is my interview suit. Very nice. (laughs) Thanks. I bought it here in Birmingham. Mum and I came for the day to look around the big stores. And you got the job? Yes. And the promotion meant I could get my own flat. Mm -hmm. I was perfectly happy living with Mum and Dad, but I felt it was time I flew the nest, and I'm only 20 minutes walk away from them. Mm. You realise what a huge impact having a home of your own, or not having one, has on people. I expect you live somewhere really smart. It's not a bad flat. Stunning view of the river. So, uh, your conference is about housing? Yes. Public and private cooperation in social housing provision. But I'm only here because my boss came back from a holiday in Morocco with a tummy bug and didn't want to come. (laughs) And then I found out at the last minute that she was deputising for her boss, so I'm way junior to everyone else here, and I have a bad case of imposter syndrome. (laughs) I'm terrified I'll let the council down every time I open my mouth. So I take heaps of notes during the sessions and hide over here during the breaks. That only leaves meals to cope with. Mm, Poor little Rachel. You're not drinking your coffee. It's more like a work of art than a drink. The way they make a design on the top and give you a little chocolate in the saucer. (laughs) I've never been in a posh hotel like this. You fit in perfectly. (laughs) Is your jacket silk? Yes. It's lovely. Though you could always make your school uniform look as if it was in a photo shoot for a fashion magazine. Especially with your amazing hair. The only thing that's different is, well, your voice. Ah, the elocution crash course. Don't let anyone tell you we live in an equal and meritocratic society, Rachel. What you look and sound like still matters in a lot of sectors, including mine. What is your sector? Finance. You work for a bank? No. What I do is search out potential investments outside the UK and make financial advisors aware of them. That's what my conference is about. Overseas investment opportunities. You must spend a lot of time in exotic places. Yes, but I'm always quite glad to be home, looking out at the Shard. 
You're still not drinking that coffee. It'll be cold. Oh, sorry. Ah, <laughs> oh, we all knew you'd be a high flyer. The way you stood out at school. Are you in contact with anyone from back then? No, I made a clean break when I left. Except for keeping in touch with Mum. Oh, I should have said. I'm sorry about your Mum. I saw the notice in the local paper. Yes, it was a blow. I was working abroad at the time and I couldn't get back for the funeral. Oh, that's tough. Ah, the elusive Sophie. I've been looking all over for you. Sophie, I need to cut and run early tomorrow before the conference ends. You know how it is, wandered in three places at once. And we need to talk about that little venture you mentioned to me. What about after dinner? A cosy chat over a drink? Oh, Greg, that would be lovely. But I've promised to meet up with the Churton group people. Uh, uh, no, d don't worry. <laughs> it's something quite different. What I told you about is strictly for the select few. Look, are you free before dinner? Say, 6.45? You can come to my room. We wouldn't be overheard or interrupted. I'm in 423. Cool. I'll be there, Sophie. Um, why did he call you Sophie? Because I'm Sophie Hyde-Smith now. New name to go with a new voice, the new me. Beryl O'Brien is no more. Well, it suits you. But does it really make so much difference? It's part of the overall picture. In my line, I need to inspire confidence. Look, Rachel, can I trust you? Yes, of course. Most of the people in this business are honest, respectable professionals trying to make a decent living. But a few aren't honest or respectable, and those are the ones I'm after. You mean money laundering and stuff like that? Are you with the police? Fraud squad? No. Although my work often dovetails with that of the police. I'm a freelance investigator, and though I say so myself, I'm good. And that's partly the image and the way people, men especially, respond to me. Isn't it dangerous? Not if you're careful. And frankly, a lot of the time I'm dealing with incompetence, not criminal intent. But how do you show that someone isn't reputable? I present them with a fake investment opportunity and see how they react. If they're honest, they'll take time going into every last detail, exercising due diligence, being absolutely certain it's above board. If they only see something that will appeal to customers, especially if they're paid a proportion of the money invested, not a flat fee, and never mind it might not be squeaky clean, then I know that I need to probe further and at some point advise the authorities to intervene. Are you doing that here? Now? Yes, you've just seen my suspect, Greg Ratcliffe. The man you meet in this evening? That's him. And actually, Rachel, you could help me. Uh, me? How? Join us this evening and pose as a satisfied existing investor in the scheme I'll be showing him. It'll add credibility. Plus, he'll be more inclined to keep his hands to himself. Oh no, Beryl. I wouldn't know what to say. Oh, you won't need to say anything. Just leave the talking to me. And you'd be doing me a big favour. All right. If it would help you. Oh, it's a bit like a movie, isn't it? A sting operation. <laughs> oh no, my next session's about to start. I must run. Not that I can run in these shoes. <laughs> Come about 6.30, room 423. Don't be late. OK. Bye. You're late. Where have you been? Sorry. Sorry. The last session overran. Couldn't you have left early? Not really. I might have missed something important. I like to take a note of all the questions. Might as well record the whole thing on your phone. OK, never mind. Sit there, get your breath back. And comb your hair, Rachel. 
image. Remember, you're a successful investor. That's better. I'm not sure I can do this, Beryl. I mean, Sophie. I'll mess it up. You don't have to do anything. Just look casual and as if you're making money. But what if he asks me a question? Then I'll answer it. Here, this is the prospectus I'm going to be showing him. It's a leisure complex in a popular holiday spot seeking investment to expand. Orchid fields. It looks completely real. All these photographs. The place is real. Only the investment opportunity isn't. Now, you put money into the previous stage of the development and this is a summary of how you're doing, which I'll show Greg. I'll ask for your permission. Just nod or say yes. Uh, uh, this has got my name on and everything. Where did it come from? I ran it off in the hotel's business room. It's not rocket science, Rachel. Okay, here we go. Don't let me down. Greg, hi, come in. Not too early, am I? I wouldn't want to interrupt a lady when she's dressing for dinner. <laughs> Though, if the lady is as lovely as you... Oh, oh, sorry. Mm. I didn't realise you had someone here. Shall I wait outside till you're finished? <sighs> no, I want you to meet Rachel. But I thought we were going to discuss... Phase three of Orchid Fields. So we are. And Rachel invested in phase two. By one of those peculiar coincidences, she's attending the other conference that's running here. The one for housing executives. So I grabbed a chance to catch up with her over coffee earlier. And then it dawned on me that she should sit in this evening. I see. Pleased to meet you. Hello. Now... You sit here, Greg, and I'll squeeze in beside you. Got enough room? I'm fine. <laughs> squeeze up all you want. <laughs> so, uh, I expect you've had a look at the complex's own website. Yes. Impressive. But no mention of the expansion plans? I thought you'd spot that straight away. <laughs> the company is keeping Phase 3 completely under wraps until the land is secured. It'll be purchased through an agent, because if word gets out, the price will skyrocket. Oh, I see. Makes sense. And planning permission? Will be no problem, because of the potential for boosting tourist income. The plans are all drawn up. The detail is in this prospectus, which of course is highly confidential at the moment. Here you go. Huh. Thank you. So... As you've seen, at present, Orchid Fields has a range of sports facilities, including tennis and squash courts, two pools, designated leisure and training, a restaurant, beautiful gardens, and aims to create the overall ambiance of an English country house weekend. It's within easy reach of at least eight hotels. The thing is, Sophie, it's aimed at the upper price bracket, and, and the hotels those people are staying at will have their own pools and classy restaurants. Excellent point, Greg. But phase three will provide a unique selling point. We're creating an island discovery zone to give visitors an insight into the island's heritage. You'll see it all laid out in the prospectus. Mm. Isn't that a bit risky? Oh, they won't mention slavery or anything horrid like that. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, it will focus on culture and environment. Interactive displays on wildlife and ecology. Performances by local musicians, dancers and storytellers, cookery demonstrations. And the expansion includes a cute little 30-seater cinema showing archive footage. Carefully curated, of course. <laughs> People want authenticity these days. And we can give tourists an authentic experience of the island's culture without sacrificing any creature comforts. It sounds as if it has great potential. It does have great potential. And as soon as I met you... I knew you would appreciate it. And it's bringing in good returns at the moment? Top notch. Uh, now, Rachel has very generously allowed me to show you the details of her investment. Rachel, you're still okay with this? Oh, uh, yes. Take a look, Greg. Rachel's just a small investor, barely 10,000. <laughs> Impressive. And this return is consistent? Oh, yes. 
And putting in phase three will make it even more reliable. Hmm. I'm pretty sure several of my clients would be interested. The thing to stress is that their money won't only be earning a good return. It'll be benefiting the island. Creating employment for local people, preserving their culture and making it more widely understood, nurturing the environment. I'm sure your clients would value that. And obviously, we'd want to reward those early investors who get us over the initial hurdle of the land purchase. The one tiny snag, Greg, is that I need to move quickly. Like I said earlier, it's all hush-hush at the moment, but the plan is bound to leak out and the price of the land we need will shoot up. How long have I got? Only ten days, I'm afraid. <laughs> That's pretty short notice. I know, and I wouldn't normally work like this, but circumstances force my hand. Well, I certainly like the look of it. Could you uh, let me have more copies of the prospectus? I'll be careful about confidentiality. I'll get a batch to your office by courier tomorrow. I'm flying out to Croatia straight after the conference, but my phone switched on 24-7. Call me day or night. It would be good to have you on board with this, Greg. I admire advisors like you who work solo and trust their instincts. Oh, <laughs> look at the time. Will you escort me down to dinner? <laughs> Delighted to. Can you switch that lamp off when you leave, Rachel? Okay, Rachel, time for dinner. Back to the annex. If you are enjoying Theatrephonic, we would really appreciate your support. By donating to our Patreon, you can help us produce more frequent episodes as well as more additional content. And by signing up to our Patreon, you will gain instant access to ad-free episodes, blooper reels and Q&A sessions, as well as the opportunity to watch live recordings and name a character in a play. Visit patreon.com forward slash theatrephonic for more information. That's patreon.com forward slash theatrephonic to get more of what you love. Bum, bum. Coming. Rachel Trent. Yes. West Mercia Police, Miss Trent. I'm Detective Inspector Meadows, and this is Detective Sergeant Casey. May we come in? Police? What's wrong? Is it my parents? I only left them an hour ago. What's happened? It's not your parents, Miss Trent. Sorry to disturb your Sunday afternoon, but we'd like to ask you a few questions. If we could come in. Come through. Please sit down. Oh, hang on, let me move that iron in. There. Have a seat. Thanks. <clears throat> I need to say before you ask me anything that I cannot disclose information about any clients without authorisation due to data protection regulations. What? Miss Trent works for the local council, sir. Uh -huh. Housing. It's nothing to do with your work, Miss Trent. At least not your work for the council. We're looking for a friend of yours, Sophie Hyde-Smith. Sophie? What do you mean, looking for her? She's missing. Do you know where she is at the moment? I've no idea. But she, she travels a lot. Are you sure she's missing? When did you last see Sophie, Miss Trent? About two months ago in Birmingham. We were at a conference. Or rather, we were at two conferences. Oh, I'm not making sense. The hotel was hosting two conferences. She was at one on finance and I was at the other on housing. And you'd arranged to meet there? No, it was pure chance. I saw her in the lobby and I couldn't believe my eyes. I hadn't seen her for ten years since we left school. You were at school together? Yes. So this is Sophie Hyde-Smith's hometown? Yes. Although, of course, she wasn't Sophie Hyde-Smith back then. So who was she? 
Beryl O'Brien. She explained about changing her name. It seemed a bit extreme to me, but what do I know? And does she have family locally? No, there was only a mother. I think her father abandoned them when Beryl was small. Mrs O'Brien's dead now. But she might still be in touch with other school friends? No, I asked her that and she said she wasn't. Let's get back to the hotel in Birmingham where you met by pure chance. What happened then? We had coffee together and chatted. Um, She told me about her work, in confidence, of course. Um, Then I went to her room in the evening before dinner while she talked to someone she was interested in. I looked out for the next day before the conference finished, but I didn't see her again. And what was she talking to this person about? An investment opportunity. Well, a pretend one, of course. A pretend one. And why were you there? I was supposed to be an existing investor to make the scheme sound credible. I didn't have to say anything, fortunately, but even so, I was scared I'd mess it up. The man was called Greg Ratcliffe. We ought to talk to him. If he's a shady character, he might even be involved in her disappearance. It was Mr Ratcliffe who reported her missing. Really? Hmm. That could be a double bluff. Let's concentrate on the talk in the hotel room. Mr Ratcliffe was supposed to believe you had invested in this fake scheme. Yes. Sophie showed him a summary of how much money I was getting from it to make him think it had a high return. But that wasn't a genuine document. Oh, no. Sophie made it herself in the hotel's business room. I don't suppose you still have it, Miss Trent? Yes, I kept it. Would you like to see it? Very much. Wait a moment, I'll get it. Is this one for real, Casey? Oh, yes, officer. I was an accomplice to a fraudster. I can't make her out, sir. Maybe she's realised the game is up and decided to appear helpful. Here you are. Thanks. How much of this money did you receive, Miss Trent? I don't understand. How much did Sophie pay you? She didn't pay me anything. I was just doing her a favour. Fair enough. And while you were with Sophie, did you happen to take a... selfie? A selfie? No. Why? Because Sophie Hyde-Smith appears to be the only person on the planet who can avoid being photographed. She evaded Mr Radcliffe's attempt and apparently her glossy website had no picture of the woman herself. Anyway, we appreciate your cooperation, Miss Trent. I take it you have a mobile phone? Yes. And a computer of some sort? A laptop, yes. Our technical people will need both of those. Sergeant Casey will give you a receipt. Then, if you'd like to come with us to the station, we'll get your statement on record. My phone and laptop? Why do you need those? Miss Trent, you've just admitted to being party to a fraud. But it wasn't an actual fraud. It was a... what do you call it? A sting. To prove Mr Ratcliffe wasn't reputable. This is absurd. Sophie works alongside the police. You you must know what she does. You're not the police at all, are you? You're looking for Sophie to do her harm. You saw our ID when you opened the door. You're welcome to see it again. Here you are. Casey, ID. That could be fake. How would I know what police ID looks like? (sighs) Miss Trent, to add to my delight at working on a Sunday... This morning my car broke down and I had to borrow one from the station. It's parked outside. Look out the window. Is that vehicle impersonating a police car? No, it's a police car. Right. So, if you'd like to give Sergeant Casey your phone and laptop, we'll complete this interview at the station. Let's go over it one more time, shall we, Miss Trent? I've told you everything that happened, Sergeant. (sighs) I met Beryl by chance. She told me she called herself Sophie now and she was a fraud investigator. She asked me to help her, so I did. 
I haven't spoken to her since. I don't even have a number. Oh, this is a nightmare. I don't understand why I'm here. Why you've taken my phone and laptop. Because you're a known associate of Sophie Hyde Smith and we want to find her. Known associate? You talk as if Sophie and I were criminals. The jury's still out on you, Ms Trent, if you'll uh, pardon the expression. But Sophie Hyde Smith is a criminal. I keep explaining this. You've got it all wrong. Sophie was trying to uncover a dishonest financial advisor, so she invented an investment opportunity for a real place to see how he responded. You're either very loyal or very dense, Rachel. I can't decide which. Do you really not know what happened after that evening in the hotel? Of course I don't. Well, Greg Ratcliffe was hooked. He advised several clients to invest in orchid fields and he put some of his own money in, though it took him a long time to admit that. So, people were sending money to orchid fields? No. They were putting money into the accounts Sophie provided. Back came a receipt, followed by official-looking paperwork a day or so later. Sophie responded immediately if Mr Ratcliffe contacted her, so everything seemed fine, and he put that particular investment to the back of his mind. Until someone sounded the alarm. What do you mean? Mr Ratcliffe got a frantic phone call from one of the clients involved. Her nephew was on holiday near Orchid Fields, so she'd asked him to take a look at the place. He was impressed, and... Wanting to be thorough, he had a chat with the manager. That's when he discovered that there were no plans to expand the site and began to suspect his aunt had been conned. But surely... Let me finish. (laughs) Mr Ratcliffe assumed it was a misunderstanding and phase three was so secret, even the manager didn't know about it. But when he tried to contact Sophie, her mobile number had been deactivated. So had her email account. Her website had disappeared. So he went to London, to the address on the prospectus, which turned out to be an empty room in a large office rental block. When he got home, he went straight to the police. That's why we're looking for Sophie Hyde Smith. And... Nearly £90,000. But... Sophie wouldn't have kept the money. It must be somewhere. Part of making a case against... Against Mr Ratcliffe? Odd that it was him who came rushing to the police, don't you think? He remembered meeting you at the hotel. Couldn't recall your surname from that fake document. Just Rebecca, Rachel, something biblical. And you were at the housing conference. We traced you through the organisers. No, he wouldn't remember me. I'm not memorable. Financial scams of all sorts are rife these days and there's a lot of pressure on police to get convictions. You would be an easy one. You've freely admitted to being party to fraud. But I didn't know it was a fraud. I mean, a genuine fraud. Oh, you know what I mean. I still can't believe Beryl. I mean... Sophie, no, I mean Beryl, would steal all that money and entangle me in it. Maybe you are an innocent party, Rachel, but appearances aren't good. Look, D.I. Meadows isn't really interested in you. He wants a big fish. Give him a way of finding Sophie and he'll forget all about you. But I don't have any way of finding her. I've told you all I know over and over again till my head aches. Well, think about it. OK, we don't need to keep you here. Once you've signed your statement, you can go. Do you want me to ring anyone to collect you? No. Yes, please. Sam Danes. Have you got the number? It's in my phone. Oh, of course, you've got my phone. OK, I'll find it. Sam Danes. Your hand's shaking, Rachel. Shall I unlock? There we are. Let's go into the kitchen and I'll make you a cup of tea. Thanks, Sam. You sit down. You're shaking all over. Right. Tea. Have you still got that dodgy kettle? No. Replaced it. You said it was dangerous. So it was. This is very good of you, Sam. At a moment's notice. Not the usual role of an ex. We parted as friends and we're still friends. 
Don't worry, Rachel. We'll sort this out. From what you told me in the car, you were completely duped. Good job she didn't ask you for money. Might have been better if she had. Then the police would have seen me as another victim, not an accomplice. What am I going to do, Sam? If they charge me? If I have to appear in court? I'll lose my job. I couldn't face everyone again, even if I wasn't found guilty. My mum and dad. How do I tell them? Keep calm, Rachel. It's not going to come to that. I told you what the sergeant said. They want to prosecute someone. They want to prosecute this Sophie person. And we are going to find them some leads. How? Not sure yet. But we'll do it. Here's your tea. Thanks. So, Beryl O'Brien. What was she like at school? Beautiful. Sophisticated, even then. Always self-assured, confident of a place in the world. I wanted so much to be friends with her, but she took no notice of me. Dull, plodding Rachel. <laughs> so, when I met her again, when Beryl O'Brien asked me for a favour... Your teenage dream came true. Couldn't you tell what she was really like? I suppose... I always knew, deep down, that she that she didn't give a damn about anyone. Although maybe she did care about her mother. The one time I saw Beryl lose a call was when someone made a disparaging remark about Mrs O'Brien working as a cleaner. But mostly she just dazzled people and used them as it suited her. Which is what happened to me in Birmingham. None of that gives us any leads, though, does it? No. Unless... You said the police wanted a picture. What about your old school photos? You mean those big group ones? Our school didn't do those. So I... Oh, I'm an idiot! The inspector asked about selfies, so I only thought about my phone. I did have a picture of Beryl. How come? I was keen on photography for a while and the last week of our final term I took my camera into school and on the last day I plucked up the courage to ask Beryl if I could take her picture. I remember blushing and stammering. I must have looked a complete fool. Never mind that. Have you still got the photograph? I haven't seen it for years but I'm sure, almost sure, it'll be in my box of old school stuff. That's in the hall cupboard. Hang on. Probably behind these paint cans. Kept all the remnants from when you helped me decorate the flat last year. I made a lousy job of this ceiling. It's all streaky. That wasn't your fault. The paint was too thin for some reason. No, not that box. You washed it out of my hair before I went home. Do you remember? Yes, I do. Got it. Here it is. She'd really changed very little. Well done, Rachel. This is what the police need. It doesn't actually locate her, though, does it? No, but it's a big step forward. Good photo. You've got just the right angle. Stunning view of her. Rachel, you okay? Stunning view. Though beauty's certainly only skin deep in this case. No, no, not her looks. Those words... Beryl said something about her flat having a stunning view of the river. OK, good. But it could be any river. No. When I asked if she travelled all over the world for her work, she said yes, but she was always glad to be home looking out at the shard. Then, oh, then I think she changed the subject. The shard must be visible for miles, though. How many flats with stunning river views, including the Shard, do you think London has? Mm, possibly quite a few, but definitely a finite number. That's the sort of searching the police are good at. And whether she's Beryl or Sophie, if she owns or rents a property, she'll leave a footprint of some sort. Utilities, bills. Bills? Paying bills? Uh, have you forgotten one? No, not me, Beryl. Oh, why didn't I think of that before? 
she was abroad for her mother's funeral, but she must have paid for it. Who else would? So there'll be a record of that with some sort of contact details. Surely they'll be genuine. Do you remember who dealt with the funeral? No. But there aren't many firms in town, are there? I'm pretty sure it was a cremation. And it would be about 18 months ago. You've done really well, Rachel. It's so much easier to remember with you than with Sergeant Casey. <laughs> Should I ring her? Yes, but I suggest you do it in the morning. Get it all clear in your mind. OK. But I need to be at work by 8.30. Call in sick. I can't do that. Yes, you can. Just this once. Are you going to be able to give sensible, balanced advice in this state? No, you're right. I'll come round in case you need a lift to the police station. They'll probably want you to take the photo in. But you need to be at work. I don't do any teaching on a Monday, so I'm flexible. I'll come over. Only if you'd like me to, of course. Yes, I would. Thanks. The photo, the flat, the funeral arrangements. Surely all that will show that I'm innocent and trying to help the police. I'll ring tomorrow. Good job I kept the landline, as I've got my mobile. Wise move. A landline is more reliable in an emergency. Oh, Sam, you're always so sensible. Is that a bad thing? No, not at all. Hi, Sam. Come in. Any news this morning? No, still nothing. Oh, this has been the longest week of my life. It's been so hard to concentrate at work and everyone's been nice to me, saying I don't look well and I should have taken more than one day off. And I can't tell anyone what's wrong and I'm constantly expecting the police to appear again and arrest me. But on Monday, you said Sergeant Casey seemed convinced you'd been... A bit naive rather than criminal. Yes, she did, but it's Inspector Meadows' opinion that counts. Oh, has it all gone quiet? No news is probably good news. Are you eating? You look thinner. I don't seem to have any appetite. Sam? It's been so good being in touch with you again this past week and I wondered if we could how you'd feel about getting back together again. That's up to you, Rachel. I didn't want us to split up. It was your choice. And it was the wrong choice. I hurt you and I'm sorry. But I was scared by how dependent I'd become. Checking every little decision with you because you're so sensible and competent. So you were more or less running my life. I didn't want to control you only look after you. I know that. I never felt controlled. I, I felt loved and protected, but I was turning back into a child, relying on you like I used to rely on mum and dad, and, and that's not how it should be. So, what do you want to do? I want us to be together again, but with me standing on my own two feet. All right. I can't promise to change my personality overnight, but I'll... Oh, who's that? Oh, I panic every time the bell rings. Shall I get it? No, no, I'll go. Coming! Oh, Sergeant Casey. Morning, Miss Trent. I've brought back your mobile and laptop. Oh, thank you. Please come in. Come through. This is Sam Danes. Miss Danes, we spoke on the phone. Yes, pleased to meet you, Sergeant. Um, would you like a cup of tea? No, thanks, Miss Trent. I won't stay. On my way to another inquiry, I seem to be on permanent weekends at the moment. If you could sign to say your property has been returned. Thanks. And there's the photograph, too. 
I wanted to call in person to tell you that the Met located that Riverside flat and their fraud team has found enough evidence to put Sophie Hyde-Smith away for a long time. This wasn't her first successful scam. (gasps) That's brilliant news, Sergeant. Has Sophie been arrested? Not yet, but it's only a matter of time. My theory is that she was heading back to the flat, saw the police vehicles and made a run for it. But we've got a couple of strong leads and I'm confident we'll find her. Maybe even the money as well. Will you need Rachel to give evidence at the trial? Uh, No, highly unlikely, I'd say. And Rachel is definitely in the clear. Entirely. (laughs) Though I'm sure you understand why we were suspicious. I'm sorry I had to put so much pressure on you, Miss Trent, but you certainly came up with the goods. Well, I'll be on my way. I'll show you out, Sergeant. Thank you again for coming over and letting us know. Well, no, yeah, no problem. <laughs> Rachel, okay. you, thank you. Thanks for everything. Uh, uh, give me our number if you need something else. Brilliant. Thanks again. We thank thanks. you. <laughs> Didn't I say no news is good news? What's the matter? Nothing. It's the relief. All that worry being lifted off you. Shall I make you a cup of tea? Sam's all-purpose remedy. In a minute. It's not only the relief, it's... Guilt. Guilt? I don't understand. I gave the police all that information so Beryl will be arrested and go to prison because of me. No. Beryl will go to prison because she's a con artist and a thief. You could have been arrested for what she did. I suppose so, but... You do sometimes hear stories of the police framing people, planting evidence. Reality check, Rachel. Beryl stole £90,000. She's done it before. You said it yourself she didn't care. She just made use of you. You're right. I'm being stupid. And it's so hard to accept that the person that you just... That the person you idolise turned into a callous, lying criminal. You have to let it go, Rachel. Let her go. I don't want to feel I'm competing with Beryl O'Brien all the time. You won't be competing with her. You're in a different league. I love you, Sam. Can I have that cup of tea now? You have been listening to Orchid Fields, written by Barbara Jennings, directed by Emmeline Brayfield, with Emma Wilkes as Rachel Trent, Drew Stevenson as Beryl O'Brien, Matt Salmon as Greg Ratcliffe, Jonathan Legg as Detective Inspector Meadows, Lydia Kenny as Detective Sergeant Casey, and Danica Corns as Sam Danes. Produced by Cat on a Piano Productions. For a full list of the music included in the play, please see our show notes. The Theatophonic theme tune was composed by Jackson Pentland, performed by Jackson Pentland, Holly Fife Taylor, and Emmeline Brayfield. For more information about the Theatophonic podcast, go to catonapiano.uk forward slash theatophonic. Tweet or Instagram us at Theatophonic, or visit our Facebook page. If you enjoy Theatophonic, and would like to get more content, please consider becoming a patron by going to patreon.com forward slash theatophonic. Thank you for listening.